this video, we'll look at some advanced topics on MOSFET operation. If you think about the equations that govern MOSFET current relationships, you'll see that much depends on the ratio of W over L, transistor width over transistor channel length. Thus, if we take a transistor with a certain width and length and scale both the width and the length by the same factor, we end up with a new transistor that can draw about the same amount of current and yet be smaller and have less capacitance associated with it, which means that we can pack more of them into a given area, manufacture them for less cost, and the lower capacitances associated with it mean that it can generally be operated at a higher speed and that it takes less power to turn the transistors on and off. So as a result, this kind of scaling of MOSFET transistors is almost like a win-win-win-win situation. So much so that the industry has pursued manufacturing technologies diligently that allow us to make MOSFETs with smaller and smaller channel lengths. This process of taking a manufacturing technology and improving it so that it can be used to manufacture transistors with a smaller minimum gate length is called MOSFET technology scaling. And it's proceeded over the past decades at an amazing rate. Shown here is a plot of the most advanced MOSFET fabrication technologies as measured by the minimum MOSFET gate length that they can make on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. And you see this improvement continuing for decades. But the most remarkable fact is that whereas the time axis is linear, the y-axis here is on a log scale, which means it's been an exponentially improving trend. In fact, the last couple of data points suggest that the trend's actually increased in the last few years. This has led to the remarkable improvements in electronics, computing, uh, that are just everywhere to be seen today. For most of the history of MOSFET technology scaling, the scaling was done following what's called a constant field scaling paradigm. That is, all the dimensions of the MOSFET were shrunk with the, by the same scaling factor. The gate length, the oxide thickness, everything scales together and the materials don't change. At the same time, the voltages associated with turning the transistor on and off also scaled proportionally so that the electric field strengths between gate and channel region and between drain and source remained relatively unchanged during this technology scaling. Now, as MOSFET transistors became very small, this ran into some limits. First of all, the threshold voltage could no longer be scaled in proportion to the supply voltages involved. And this limit arose because of subthreshold leakage, which we'll talk about shortly. The other challenge that's arisen recently is simply that our ability to make metal contacts to the drain source and gate regions that are so tiny uh, has become a bottleneck in the performance of these transistors. So in recent years, technology scaling hasn't been a panacea, but nevertheless, the shrinking of transistor sizes has allowed more and more of them to be packed onto a single chip. So if nothing else, you've got more and more memory and more and more microprocessors crammed alongside each other, which can be its own tremendous benefit. We briefly mentioned the problem of leakage in MOSFETs. Leakage is the flow of current into or out of any terminal of a MOSFET where we don't expect current to be flowing. So for example, we've until now always assumed that the current the DC current flowing in or out of the gate is zero because there's a very good insulator, silicon dioxide, separating it from any other conductors in the MOSFET. However, that oxide is so very thin that a small amount of leakage current can indeed flow into the gate down into the channel region. That's one source of gate of leakage called gate leakage.
Perhaps a, the largest source of leakage, however, is called subthreshold leakage. So when the gate source voltage is below the threshold voltage, our expectation is that the transistor is in cutoff and that there's depletion regions formed around the source and drain regions that prevent conduction. However, especially as transistor lengths become very small, a finite amount of current still can flow between drain and source, even when the gate source voltage is below the, sub th is below the threshold voltage. So this finite current is called subthreshold leakage. So shown here in the top right is our familiar plot of drain current versus gate source voltage obtained while keeping the drain source voltage quite large. So large enough to ensure the transistors in saturation so that we see the familiar square law. That is, as long as VGS is below the threshold voltage, the transistor is cut off and we see near zero drain current and that beyond VTN, current increases uh, with square law. But now what we know is that with subthreshold leakage, if we zoom in on this part of the plot, we see that the current doesn't drop right to zero. Rather, it decreases exponentially towards zero, but never actually reaching it. This exponential decline in drain current as VGS enters subthreshold is visible by the straight line on this semi-log plot. So importantly, this is still a plot of drain current versus gate source voltage, just like above, but now the drain current is plotted on a log scale so that we can see the finite current flowing in subthreshold operation. So this implies that not only does current flow when VGS is below the threshold voltage, but in fact, the finite current flows even when VGS is zero volts. As long as there's some drain source voltage appearing, a tiny leakage current will flow. This may seem insignificant, but when you've got millions or even billions of transistors packed onto a single chip, it can add up, especially in devices that are battery operated. Yet another source of leakage current is the finite current that flows through the reverse biased PN junctions between body and drain and body and source. As we know, any PN junction does conduct a finite current even when reverse biased. And the same is true for those junctions. Again, of all these leakage currents, subthreshold leakage is the largest. It's, it's useful at this time to consider temperature effects in MOSFETs. Now, as the temperature of a MOSFET increases, a couple of things happen. The threshold voltage goes down. For PMOS transistor, the absolute value of the threshold voltage would come down. And at the same time, mu C ox also comes down. So looking at the IV characteristics plotted on the right, what does that imply? Well, the threshold voltage shifting down means that this quadratic part of the IV characteristic starts earlier, but the fact that mu N C ox declines means that it increases uh, less sharply. So we get a new curve, something like this. Um, so the result, the net result is that at any uh, currents of interest in saturation, as temperature increases, we would expect to see less and less drain current. However, if we think about what happens in the subthreshold region, Although the decline in mu and C ox means that this part of the curve might come down, the threshold voltage moving over to the left has a more significant effect. So in fact, as temperature goes up, subthreshold leakage increases. So for this reason, uh, the performance of a MOSFET circuit 
at high temperatures is often a worst case. We've got the lowest current for the transistors that are on and the highest current for the transistors that are off. Considering the y-axis here is on a log scale, keep in mind that this increase in leakage current can be really significant. So, for example, the battery life of mobile devices can be significantly impacted by the temperature at which they're operated. We've also so far essentially neglected the impact of the body terminal, the MOSFET. We have simply said, well, as long as the body is connected to a voltage so that its junctions remain reverse biased, we need not worry about it. But clearly, it has some effect on the operation of the MOSFET. So the easiest way I think to understand it is to recognize that if you just look at the cross section of a MOSFET when the channel's inverted, you see that the gate is influencing the channel by a field effect, as the name suggests. Because of its close proximity to the channel, any applied voltage to the gate induces an electric field in the channel that influences the channel region and modulates um, its conductivity. But the body region is essentially very much the same. It's in close proximity to the channel region and is separated from it by a relatively narrow insulating region. In this case, the insulator is simply depleted silicon, which is in fact a very good insulator. Therefore, the body exerts a field effect on the channel very much like the gate. For this reason, the body is terminal is sometimes referred to as a back gate. In fact, before we figured out how to make very thin insulating layers and realize a MOSFET, there were field effect transistors that operated simply using a back gate like this. They're called JFET, junction field effect transistors, because the channel is modulated by a field effect, but the insulator is a reverse biased PN junction. So just remembering that the body has this similar field effect on the channel region, similar to the gate, helps you understand um, and have some intuition for the body's effect on conduction between the drain and source. Now, we can't really, in this NMOS transistor, lift the body voltage above that of the source or channel region, because that's gonna start to forward bias the PN junctions and cause uh, large current to flow, you know, the current through a forward bias PN junction gets large very quickly. Um, but what can happen is that the body voltage can drop below that of the source. So when we, let's think about we, what happens when we have an inverted channel and we decrease the gate voltage for an NMOS transistor like this. Well, if we decrease the gate voltage, the channel becomes weaker and its resistivity increases and less drain current flows. So similarly, if we drop the body voltage, the same thing will happen. The channel will get weaker and um, there'll be less drain current. So let's imagine that we drop the body voltage by inserting a voltage source here and the amount by which the body voltage decreases is the source to body voltage. So we'll call it VSB, the source, in this case, staying at ground. Now, the way we model the resulting drop in drain current is to imagine that introducing VSB increases the threshold voltage of the MOSFET. As you can imagine, increasing the threshold voltage of the MOSFET will, uh, we're keeping the gate source voltage the same, will tend to decrease the drain current. So that's how we model this body effect. But you'll see that the way it shows that the, the equation for modeling this is fairly complex. It involves several device constants here and here. Um, rather than go into all the device physics required to understand these terms, I think it's important, first of all, that you see that the intuition that we described is um, is codified in this model. So 
When v, as Vsb increases, it implies that the body voltage is dropping, the threshold voltage therefore goes up, and the drain current will drop, just as we expect from a field effect, um, like the one we illustrated in green here. The second uh, point of intuition is to, is to recognize that there's a square root relationship there, because unlike the gate channel capacitance, which is determined by an oxide region with a fixed thickness, T ox. In this case, the insulator between the back gate and the channel is a depletion region whose thickness will actually change with the voltage applied across it. Remember that the depletion region width changes as the reverse bias voltage on the PN junction changes. So with VSP, uh, with VSB changing, we see the, the field effect becomes more complex because effectively the width of the insulators, the thickness of the insulator is also changing at the same time. So capturing that dependence gives rise to these square root terms in this expression. This so-called body effects impact on the drain current can be neglected if the source is shorted to the body. In such cases, VSB is zero. And substituting that into the expression above, we see that the threshold voltage is simply equal to VT0. So VT0 can be thought of as the nominal threshold voltage for the MOSFET in the absence of any body effect. So if you purchase or use a discrete MOSFET with only three terminals, that's what's happening. Internally within that package, the body terminal has been shorted to the terminal that's labeled source, so that you need not worry about the body effect in those cases. Finally, we consider a slightly different type of MOSFET called a depletion type MOSFET. So far, we've focused our attention on MOSFETs that have, for NMOS transistors, a positive threshold voltage, and for PMOS transistors, a negative threshold voltage. But in fact, it's possible to engineer NMOS transistors so that they have a negative threshold voltage. In such cases, the IV relationship looks like this. Again, VGS is plotted on the x-axis, drain current on the y-axis, with VDS held constant at a large voltage, so that we're always either in cutoff or saturation. We're never in tryout. So with a negative threshold voltage, it means that even with VGS equal to zero, there is a channel region present and current can flow between drain and source. So MOSFETs of this type are identified with a slightly different schematic symbol. You'll note that there's a thicker bar connecting drain and source in the schematic symbol. And that's to indicate that a channel region is present even with zero gate source voltage applied. Now, in order to turn a transistor like this off, you need to apply a negative gate source voltage. And it has to be negative enough to overcome the negative threshold voltage. At that point, the transistor can be cut off. Whenever you operate this transistor with a negative gate source voltage, you're depleting the channel, the pre existing channel. So it's called operating it in depletion mode. On the other hand, if you increase VGS above zero, you're enhancing the channel that's already there. So that's called enhancement mode. Note that the overdrive voltage is still equal to the gate source voltage minus the threshold voltage, even though the threshold voltage is negative. And the condition for ensuring that the transistor is in saturation is the same as it was for enhancement mode devices. That is, VDS has to be greater than the overdrive voltage. Depletion type MOSFETs can be very useful in some applications, but they're a relatively specialized device, so we won't discuss them much further.